All right, welcome back to another installment of your heart failure content. So um, in this video, we're going to talk about uh, diagnosing patients with heart failure. So um, first off, let's talk about the clinical presentation. How do these patients present? So what symptoms, um, signs and symptoms are they having? So we can talk about symptoms, signs and symptoms related to congestion. Remember that fluid backup, um, that, that preload, that pre-aorta fluid that's having trouble uh, ejecting from the heart because the, the heart isn't functioning properly. And then we also have hypoperfusion signs and symptoms because if you're ultimately not getting enough cardiac output, you're not getting enough perfusion, blood flow, oxygenation to tissues, and you will have signs and symptoms that exhibit that. So first off, let's talk about congestion. So fluid, blood, right? That's, that's weight. So patients will experience weight gain. Uh, it's very typical to ask patients to sort of monitor their weight and uh, give the office a call if they, you know, see um, an increase in their, in their weight over, you know, a period of, of days. Uh, other things that patients will experience, shortness of breath, uh, orthopnea, uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, right? And so all of these things really have to do with fluid that's backing up into the lung. So with that, um, and if these terms, uh, you know, aren't immediately familiar to you, uh, we've gone over them in patient assessment, we've gone over them in patho, just make sure you look them up so that you know what they, what they are because you do need to, to know them. Um, so with fluid in the lung, you can see pleural effusions. Uh, if you do like a chest x-ray, So you can actually see that on the, the x-ray, you can see that fluid sitting uh, at the base of the lung that's, you know, backed up from, um, from the left side of the heart, backed up uh, into the lung. You can hear on auscultation extra heart sounds. So normal heart sounds, remember, are S1, S2. If you hear S3, S4, that's due to a delayed closure of the valves due to uh, increased fluid, a peripheral edema. especially um, pitting edema. So pitting edema, um, remember, is when like you take, um, take a fingertip and you press on a patient's um, lower extremity, like their, their leg, their calf maybe, and when you press down and you take your finger away, that indentation remains for a little bit of time. It takes a little while for um, sort of the skin to pop back up. That's, that's pitting edema and providers will actually grade that based on um, how deep that edema is and how, um, how long it takes for that kind of bounce back to occur. They use like one plus, two plus, three plus pitting edema. You don't need to know like how that grading happens. Um, you just need to know that that terminology exists. Uh, elevated BNP. This is brain naturetic peptide. So uh, remember, natriuretic peptides come from the um, from the ventricle, and they are uh, elevated due to increased stretch. So if the ventricle is stretched out because there's additional fluid there, uh, preload, the ventricle will sense that and realize, hey, I'm fluid overloaded. I need to get rid of some of this fluid. I'm going to release BNP, which will go to the kidneys and tell the kidneys to pee out extra salt and water. So it's a protective mechanism to try to reduce some of that fluid overload that the heart is experiencing. Uh, and also JVD, jugular venous distension. 
And I'm going to grab this picture here in the corner and show you that real quick. Okay. So this is jugular venous distension here. So you have the patient lay at like a 45 degree incline, you have them turn their head and then you can evaluate the degree of distension. Again, it's like a one plus two plus three plus thing typically. Um, and they look right here at this, um, this, this jugular vein and they, again, they're all trained, you know, to make that sort of assessment. You are not, you do not need to, but you should be able to recognize in a patient's, um, you know, physical exam findings, if JVD is noted, you should know that that is a sign of congestion and fluid overload. All right, let me get this guy out of the way. All right, on to our signs of hypoperfusion. We'll do these in a different color. Fatigue, cyanosis, cold extremities. Okay, so cyanosis is like, uh, you know, kind of a blue tinge. Uh, so if you're not getting enough oxygenation, um, you know, very simply, you know, your your muscles, your organs, um, they're, they're going to be tired. You're going to be tired. You, you know, will have cool extremities. They might even be a little blue tinged due to a lack of oxygenation. Um, organ dysfunction, So, you know, organ dysfunction, um, you know, can come in, in many flavors. You know, if um, hypoperfusion is bad enough and like the brain is being hypoperfused, you could see things like confusion. Um, more commonly, we see things um, like uh, decreases in renal perfusion. So we can see increases in serum creatinine. Uh, sometimes we'll see decreases in liver perfusion. So we'll see increases in LFTs because LFTs are being released due to hypoperfusion and some um, hepatocyte damage. So you're going to need to be able to recognize that if you see abnormalities occurring within an organ in the setting of hypoperfusion and heart failure, that that is a relevant um, sign that you uh, should be able to pick up on for uh, heart failure. Other things, um, altered altered mental status, which you know we we kind of talked about under the organ dysfunction spectrum, and then you'll also see tachycardia, because if you're hypoperfusing tissues, the body is going to try to increase cardiac output, right? And remember we said that one of the determinants of cardiac output is heart rate, so the heart can just pump faster to try to get more cardiac output. That's another, um, that's another like compensatory mechanism that the, the body will use. In terms of like formal um, testing or tests that, you know, we'll, we'll use to evaluate heart failure, really the big one is um, echocardiography or an echocardiogram. That's just like an ultrasound of the, of the heart um, Actually, let me see if I can grab a quick picture to show you. All right, so this is a picture of an echocardiogram. So you can see the technician is um, using an ultrasound um, on the patient's chest. And then this is the, the image um, that they're looking at. And then a, a cardiologist will go and read the... Um, the, the video recording that's made. And so on echo, you know, we can evaluate things like ejection fraction. Um, we can evaluate like the chambers of the heart, you know, to look for um, distension, to look for hypertrophy, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, we can also evaluate the valves um, and any like wall motion abnormalities. So, you know, again, more kind of with like systolic or reduced ejection fraction heart failure, you know, is the, um, is the, is the heart contracting uh, in a concerted, uh, efficient manner, or is there some like motion abnormality probably due to like 
you know, some myocyte damage that has diseased like a large portion of the of the heart. So echo is a um, the main test that we use to um, keep an eye on patients' heart failure and see how they're doing. Let's get this picture out of the way. Um, one thing that um, we haven't talked about yet is really sort of like the the waxing and waning nature of of heart failure. So I'm going to make another drawing kind of just a, above what we've written out here. Um, so let's do some axes here. And let's do um, time over here and functionality. And by functionality, I mean um, like how well the patient can live, function, perform their activities of daily living, go for a walk, um, you know, um, walk up flights of stairs. That's what I mean by, by functionality. So over here, we'll say, you know, this is time zero. This is when heart failure starts. All right, and so um, when patients are initially diagnosed, you know, they're probably symptomatic. You know, they, um, you know, are likely coming in with some of these symptoms that they haven't experienced before. And that's how you do the workup for heart failure. Maybe they've got like a past medical history of coronary artery disease or something that, you know, gives you a pretty high suspicion of it. But you do the workout with the workup and you see that they, in fact, you know, do have heart failure. Their echo shows they have heart failure. So in terms of functionality, when they're coming in symptomatic like that, you know, they're probably not as functional as maybe they were before right? So they're experiencing these symptoms. You kind of tune them up. You give them some diuretics. You make them feel better, right? And they go home and they feel a little bit better, all right? But they're never going to get back to maybe where they were, you know, we'll call this like pre-heart failure, right? But they got a little bit better, okay? And they're, they're doing well for a little while. And then they have another exacerbation, Right. And so they come in to the to the to the hospital or to their provider, you know, maybe they're having uh, weight gain, shortness of breath, that sort of thing. Right. And so you tune them up and they get a little bit better and they stay there and then they take another dip and they have another exacerbation. You tune them up, you send them out and then they have another dip. Right. And so over time, you can sort of see this pattern where they experience these exacerbations and those are what we call acute decompensated heart failure episodes. So heart failure is really managing both the chronic nature of the disease. So here, you know, these are more of the chronic management and also managing these, these dips where they have exacerbations. So the other thing I want to point out is that you'll notice that patients over time, even when they're in like their chronic state where they're maybe not experiencing, you know, a whole lot of symptoms, they're not having symptoms of acute decompensated heart failure, right? Even when they're in these stages, you can see over time their functionality is coming down. This is a chronic disease. So, you know, it's by nature uh, a, a disease that over time declines. So you really want to try to, you know, optimize therapy to sort of decrease the slope in this decline, but also minimize these dips where they have exacerbations. So largely when we talk about these symptoms, we're talking about these dips, these exacerbations that patients are having. Our goal is really to have patients be as symptom-free as possible when they're in these kind of chronic stages where they're not having exacerbations. Now, not every patient is symptom-free, unfortunately, in the chronic portions of their management, especially as they kind of get more down here uh, towards like the end of the, the heart failure spectrum. Um, those patients, unfortunately, over time, 
uh, start to experience symptoms um, as, as often as like even at, at rest. Um, so, you know, it's, it's really the goal of therapy to try to prevent that from happening. But unfortunately, over time, that does occur.